So we've been talking about heat engines in general and Rankine cycles in particular. We went through a couple examples with a four component Rankine cycle and we saw that the thermal efficiency wasn't even half of what that Carnot efficiency told us it could be. We went through different ideas on how to improve Rankine efficiency last class, talking about reheat in particular, and today we're going to talk about another strategy that we can use to improve Rankine efficiency that we call regeneration. So we know that the thermal efficiency for a heat engine is given by taking the energy benefit divided by the energy cost or the net power divided by the heat transfer in. We also know that if we look at a first law analysis of the entire system, we see that the net power is the same as the net heat. Last class, we talked about reheat, which I think about as adding another turbine to get more net power out of the system. Today, we're going to talk about a way to reduce the required input heat in our system, and that method is called regeneration. So how does regeneration work? So again, we're going to be taking our Rankine cycle and making it more complicated so that we can try to improve the thermal efficiency. So what we do here is, again, we have a steam generator and high pressure, high enthalpy steam that enters the first stage or the high pressure stage of our turbine. Now, as we go through this high pressure stage, this is where we'll extract most of the power. But when we move between the high pressure and the low pressure turbine, what we're going to do is we're going to bleed off some of our mass flow rate, some fraction Y, which is typically a small percent, less than half of the mass transfer that's going through the system. Then what we do is we take the rest of the mass flow rate, 1 minus y, right? So if y was 20%, then we would take 20% off here, and the 80% would go through the secondary turbine, the condenser, and the pump. Now, why do we do this, right? So we do this because now this material, this matter that came out of our high-pressure turbine comes out with still a fairly high enthalpy, right? So its temperature is relatively high compared to what's going on over here in the condenser. So what we do is we're preheating this fluid that comes out of the condenser using something we've already heated up. Now, all of the mass comes back together in what we call this open feed water heater. It's called the open feed water heater because it's an open system where here the mass, this hot mass, which is water, can mix with this cold mass, which is water, in one open system. So it's not um, separated on either side. We can cross the streams of the mass in this case. All of the mass comes back together here and goes through on this purple line, which is the total mass flow rate. So if you're doing a problem like this, I would encourage you again to use something like a colored pencil so that you can color code which fraction of the mass is going through which component or exists at which state. I think that'll make things a little bit easier. Now, when you look at the diagram here, you might think this is going to be tricky because unlike all the other Rankine cycles we've looked at so far, Mass conservation is going to be important here because we don't have the same amount of mass going through every component of our system. So the benefit of doing regeneration is that we increase thermal efficiency. We do that mainly by reducing the amount of heat that's required to boil this water, right? So this water that comes through the condenser gets preheated by this mass that we've bled off. That increases our average temperature of heat addition because the temperature going into the steam generator or the boiler is higher than it otherwise would be. And it lowers the amount of heat that's rejected in the condenser because not all the mass flow rate comes out or comes through our condenser. So we reject less heat this way. 
Now, it's also true that we're going to be producing less power because we bleed off some of this mass, so not all of the mass flow rate goes through our second stage turbine. But what happens in this case is that the rate at which we're decreasing the heat in is bigger than the rate at which we're reducing the net power. So we have a net gain in efficiency. And we'll see that as we go through some problems on the homework. So because this strategy improves the thermal efficiency of these kinds of thermodynamic cycles, they're LORACs approved. Generally, there are two different types of regeneration systems that we can look at. And they're defined by what happens in this feed water heater. Now, the feed water heater is the heat exchanger that we use to transfer the heat from our hot flow that we bled off after that first turbine to our cold flow that's been condensed. So we talked a little bit already about this open feed water heater where these two streams of mass meet together under the same pressure in some reservoir. So this is kind of the equivalent. I think I've talked about this before. My grandfather, when he used to shave, he had a sink where there was a hot tap and a cold tap and it would come out of different spigots and he'd mix the water to get warm water in the basin. That's sort of how this open feed water heater works where you have two inlets and one outlet, right? So the hot side, the cold side, and then this warm fluid comes out of state six in our open feed water heater. Now, an alternative to that is this closed feed water heater. So now you take this higher pressure, higher enthalpy fluid, and it's going to run in this kind of shell and tube heat exchanger. So this hot fluid is going to be running through the shell. And then the cold fluid, which has been condensed, runs through the tube here. And heat is transferred from our hot side to our cold side, but they never physically mix. In this case, then that hot mass flow which gets cooled down in this closed feed water heater, runs back through to the condenser. And in this condenser, it also condenses. And then the condensed fluid runs through and is preheated as it runs through this feed water heater. Now, in a power plant, you're not just going to pick one of these options. Most power plants are very complicated and will often have multiple different strategies of improving thermal efficiency to get close to that Carnot efficiency. But in all of these cases, right, or both of these cases, we have some portion of the mass that gets diverted. So that's the total mass flow rate times this diverted mass fraction y. So y is just some number between 0 and 1. And typically, it's less than half, maybe something like 0.2. Then we have the non-diverted mass. This is the mass flow rate that goes through our second stage turbine, denoted here in blue. And this is, if y was 20%, then this would mean that 80% of the mass flow rate goes through this second stage turbine. But notice the path is different. So here it goes through the condenser in this first pump to come to this intermediate pressure. Whereas here, we're only going through this first or the second stage of the turbine. And then it's the one of the inlets to the condenser here. So the path is a little bit different. And then we'll have after the mass all comes together. So the math, mass comes together in two different points in these two different versions of the cycle. One in the open feed water heater and the other in the condenser over here. But eventually all the mass comes back together and it runs on this purple line, which is the total mass flow rate. So it's really important when you're doing these cycles to keep track of conservation of mass and to know what mass flow rate is associated with which state going into or coming out of which component. So we'll go through this just to look to see how we can develop equations for isentropic efficiency for both these types of systems, for both types of regeneration systems here. And you can use this method. It doesn't matter how complicated a cycle I give you. I could, on an exam, I could give you a cycle with multiple reheat stages and regeneration, and you can still use this same idea to go through and develop an expression for the thermal efficiency. So we know that thermal efficiency is given by the energy benefit over the energy cost or the net power 
divided by the heat in, or I can take the specific net power, which is little w dot, that's the same as w dot divided by m dot, divided by the specific heat transfer rate. Again, that's the heat transfer rate divided by the mass flow rate. So if I want to do this, the first thing that I want to do is in my state table, I want to look at what is the fraction of the mass flow rate that goes through different components. So here, first I look for the components that get the total mass flow rate. So in this case, that's going to be the high pressure turbine as I go from state one to state two. That's going to be pump two in this case as I go from state six to state seven. And it's going to be the steam generator as I go from state, state seven to state one. So this is kind of why I like to do this with a color pencil when I'm doing these problems so that I can make a note to myself which mass flow rate goes where. Next, I know that there's some components that get the non-diverted mass flow rate, right? So this would be 80% if Y was 20%, right? So this is going to be my low pressure turbine, my condenser, and my first pump. Right? And then in the place where the mass flow rate comes together, it's a little tricky because we'll have a different mass flow rate that's associated with each of the different states. So here in the hot path, I have state two coming in. So this is going to be the diverted mass flow rate. Over here, I have state five coming in. So it's going to be the non-diverted mass flow rate. And then at state six coming out, I'm going to have the total mass flow rate. So when I look at the open feed water heater, I have different mass flow rates for each different state because the purpose here is we're bringing all the mass back together. So if I did conservation of mass on this particular open feed water heater, if it was at steady state, what I'd find is that the mass flow rate coming in here at two, that's going to be Y plus the mass flow rate coming in here at five, which is one minus Y. If I add those together, I get the outlet mass flow rate, which is going to be one. So what do I do next? Next, I want to construct a symbolic solution for the net power. So our net power is going to be the sum of all of our turbine powers plus the sum of all of our pump powers. Now I've color coded this too to remind me that the turbine powers are going to be positive and the pump powers are going to be negative if I develop these equations from the first law. So I look for the sum of the turbine powers and I see that there's two turbines in this cycle. And then I look for the sum of the pump powers and I see that there's two pumps in this cycle. So I'll have four terms in my net power, the two turbines and the two pumps. So if I do the first law here and I assume that these turbines and these pumps are all steady state, adiabatic, one inlet, one outlet, and I can neglect changes in potential energy and kinetic energy. So these are the assumptions I normally associate with turbines and pumps. Then I'll find that for each different component, it's going to be the mass flow rate through that component multiplied by H in minus H out. And that's what I'm showing here. Now, each one of these terms I've color coded to remind myself that the turbine powers are positive and the pump powers are negative. I have also kept the subscripts on the mass flow rates here because the mass flow rates through each component can be different. So here, again, I'll break out my colored pencils and I'll see that the mass flow rate through my first turbine is the total mass flow rate. The mass flow rate through my second turbine is the undiverted mass flow rate, or 1 minus y times m dot. The mass flow rate through the first pump is also the undiverted mass flow rate. And the mass flow rate through the second pump is the total mass flow rate. Now, the reason that I write these things as a fraction of the total mass flow rate is because now I get to a point where all of these terms are still a function of m dot. So I can take the specific net power or I can divide both sides of this equation by m dot. And here, now I get little w dot net and the m dot terms drop out from all of these terms. But I'm still left with the mon one minus y for the second turbine in the first pump. So I'm still sort of 
tracking the fact that the mass conservation tells us that there's a different amount of mass flow through these different components. So next, if we're talking about thermal efficiency, we have to find out where we're adding heat. Now, unlike the reheat system, where we were adding heat twice, here we're only adding heat once. So remember, this is the heat that we haven't paid for yet, right? The heat that we're adding as a result of burning coal or maybe doing a nuclear reaction. So here, there's almost some heating of the fluid. You could convince yourself that there's some heating of the fluid going on in the open feed water heater, but this is heat that we've already paid for, right? So this is the, the marketing people will sometimes tell you that something's free, but often, right, if you go to the gym and maybe they give you a free t-shirt, it's just that that t-shirt was included in the monthly membership fee that you're already paying. So here, right, we are only interested when we're talking about thermal efficiency about the heat that gets added to the system because we were burning some coal, right? So in this case, there's only one heat transfer rate term. That's going to be M dot through the boiler, or in this case, the steam generator, times H out, that's H1, divided by H, or minus H in, that's H7. So here, we look back at that chart that we made, and we remember that the total mass flow rate is going through the steam generator, so M dot B is just M dot, or the total mass flow rate. So then, again, if I divide this by the total mass flow rate, then I get that the specific heat transfer rate going in at the boiler is H1 minus H7. So now for this open feed water heater that's undergoing regeneration in our Rankine cycle, I can find that the thermal efficiency in this case is given as a function of the enthalpies at the different states and as a function of the diverted mass flow or the undiverted mass flow in this case because it's one minus y. So sometimes we'll be given enough information that we can fix all the states but we won't know the mass flow rate, right? Or we won't know the diverted mass flow rate. We need to find y. So I think there's generally two ways that we can do this. So sometimes in a problem it will tell me what the net power that's developed by the whole cycle is. And in that case, I'll have an expression for w dot net, right? That's my numerator here. That's a function of all those enthalpies and of y. So if I knew all the enthalpies and I knew w dot net, then I could use that information to find y. I think it's probably more common that I won't know the net power, that that's probably something that the problem will ask me for. And instead, I'll have to look for a place where I can apply the first law to try to find a mass flow rate. Now, I've said this before, but if you're looking for a mass flow rate, it's often, not always, but often a good idea to do a first law analysis on an entire heat exchanger. And in this case, a heat exchanger that's probably going to give us some expression with Y in it is the open feed water heater. So I'll go about doing that now. So if I do a first law analysis on my open feed water heater, what I'll assume is that it's at steady state, that it's adiabatic, that even though heat is being transferred from my hot flow to my cold flow, so I get this warm outlet, there's no heat being lost to the surroundings. I'm going to say that this is passive because there's no fan blades inside my open feed water heater. I'm going to say that this is, uh, I can neglect the changes in kinetic and potential energy. And then what I'll find is the sum of m dot in h in is equal to the sum of m dot out h out. So now I know that I have two inlet states. I have the total mass flow rate times the fraction that's diverted. That's coming in at h2 and the fraction that's undiverted that's coming in at H5. What's leaving is only state 6, so in this case I get the total mass flow rate multiplied by H6. So again, I'm looking at the mass flow rates associated with each of the ports 
on my open feed water heater, I'm looking at them as fractions of the total mass flow rate. Because then I don't even need to know the total mass flow rate. It can drop out here and I can still, if I can fix state 2 and state 5 and state 6, then the only thing in this equation I won't know is y. And I can use this expression to find y if I can fix those states. So that's kind of how we deal with an open feed water heater. If we look at the closed feed water heater, we can follow a similar process, but we'll get to a slightly different end result. So let's go through that now. Again, we get that the thermal efficiency is the energy benefit, or W dot net, divided by the cost, which is the heat transfer in. First, I want to look at what the mass flow rate looks like through all these different parts. When we're analyzing these regeneration systems, it's often the heat exchangers that are going to be important for us, right? They're often the keys to unlock the mass flow rates. So here, we're interested in the condenser. This is where all the mass comes back together in this case. But we're also interested in the open feed water heater. So these are two components where the mass flow rates will be different at the different ports. So here, I can see that the total mass flow rate goes through the high pressure turbine, the first pump, I think there's, it's the only pump in this case, and then the steam generator. The low pressure turbine gets the undiverted mass flow going through the whole low pressure turbine. And then I can start to look at these heat exchangers. So when I look at the condenser, state three comes in at the undiverted mass flow. State eight comes in at the diverted mass flow rate, and state four goes out at the total mass flow rate. If I look at the closed feed water heater, it's got two sides, right? This is like the Ghostbusters, these two streams, they can't mix. So on the cold side, as I go from state five to state six, that's the entire mass flow rate that's the cold part, right? So this is the condensed liquid. And then on the hot side, I have only this diverted portion of the mass y so now i've figured out which mass flow rates go with which components or which states that are the inlet and outlet ports of my heat exchangers again if i'm trying to get thermal efficiency for a heat engine i want to look at the net power in this case i want to find the sum of all the turbine powers and the sum of all the pump powers so I count up the turbines and I see that there's two of them, but there's only one pump in this case. So here we add the two turbines and the pumps together, getting expressions for W dot from the first law and remembering that pump power is negative. When I do that, if I can make the assumptions that I usually make that give me that the, or that the power of a turbine or a pump is M dot times H in minus H out, I'll get this expression. But I have to remember, again, that the mass flow rate through these different components aren't necessarily the same. So I look back on that table that I had, and I see that I get the total mass flow rate through the first turbine and through the pump, but I only get the undiverted mass flow rate through the second turbine. Again, all of these terms are a function of the mass flow rate, the total mass flow rate, so I can divide by m dot, the total mass flow rate, and get a specific net power that's a function of enthalpies and y. Now I'm going to look for the heat in. And in this case, there's only one place where we're adding heat because we're burning coal or running a nuclear reaction. So we only have to worry about the heat transfer rate that's going in at our steam generator or our boiler. This again is going to be m dot of the boiler times H out minus H in. We see that the whole mass flow rate goes through the boiler, so this is going to be the total mass flow rate. So if I want the specific heat transfer rate in, it's just going to be H1 minus H6. So now I can get an expression for the thermal efficiency of this regenerative Rankine cycle that uses a closed feed water heater. In this case, I have an expression that's only a function of the specific enthalpies in my system across all these different states and 
of y, which is the diverted mass flow. So again, we're going to come to a problem where how do we find y? And again, I think the two most likely ways to find y is that you're given the net power. So if I know numerically this net power or the specific net power, and I can figure out all the enthalpies, then I can use that information to find y. Or maybe more often, we'll be asked to do a first law analysis on the feed water heater in order to find y. So if we were going to do a first law analysis on the closed feed water heater, what does that look like? Here, again, if we do the first law and we make all the same assumptions that we saw before, we'll get that the sum of m dot in h in is equal to the sum of m dot out h out. So now what happens is I can look at the inlets, and the inlets in this case are what's going on at state 2. That's the diverted mass flow rate times state 2. And then what's going on at state 5, which is the total mass flow rate times the enthalpy at state 5. The outlets are going to be, again, we have the diverted mass flow rate coming through here at state 7, and we have the total mass flow rate here at state 6. So from this equation, because m dot total is equal to m dot total, this is the total mass flow rate going through the system. So that's going to drop out. And we have another expression that's a function of some specific enthalpies and of the diverted mass flow rate. So I can use this to find y as well. So here's just a quick example. We have a system with a closed feed water heater. So this is a Rankin cycle with regeneration that uses a closed feed water heater. And we're asked to find first the mass diverted. So what's the fraction of the mass flow that's diverted here at state two? So what is y? And then we're asked to find what's h6. So h6 is this outlet at the closed feed water heater. Basically, this is asking how much heat did we add to the cold flow so that we could increase the enthalpy. Now here we have a mostly complete state table. So we have from states one to eight, all of this information given. Now on an exam, you probably wouldn't have all of this information given unless this was maybe a multiple choice question, but you probably wouldn't have all of the state table empty either. So in a homework problem, you'll probably be asked to do a whole wealth of state fixing in order to find the answer. On an exam problem, you'll probably get some of the information and we, we sort of will strategically leave blanks in here so that you can demonstrate maybe how do you how do you use an isentropic turbine or how do you find the diverted mass flow rate y, right? So in this case, we're asked what is y and then what is h6? So the first part of this problem asks me to find the diverted mass flow rate. Now, I've said that usually there's basically two ways that we can do this. And one of the ways is if we know the net power or the specific net power. And the other way would be to do a first law analysis here on the closed feed water heater. So I can do this closed feed water heater analysis if I know H2, H5, H6, and H7. But here I don't know H6. At least I don't know it yet. So I can't do the first law analysis on the closed feed water heater. And that's probably why the problem gave me the net specific power. So let's see if I can find the diverted mass flow rate. So I know that the net power is given by summing together the power from all the turbines and all the pumps. In this case, we have two turbines and one pump. I can make all the assumptions that I usually make about turbines to find that each one of these turbines and pumps is going to be m dot times h in minus h out. And since we've already derived this equation, I'm just going to jump to this equation here where the specific net power is going to be h1 minus h2 plus the undiverted mass flow rate, 1 minus y, times h2 minus h3, this is the power through that second stage turbine, plus the power consumed by the pump, which is h4 minus h5. In this case, I'm told the specific net power, I know h1, I know h2, I know h3, I know h4, and I know h5. 
The only thing in this equation I don't know is y. So what I'll do is I'll solve for y, and in this case, I find that the diverted mass flow is 0.23 or 23%. So now, how do I use this to find state 6? So almost always in these problems, you're going to have to do a first law analysis on the feed water heater. It's just we don't know exactly why we're doing it before we sort of look at the problem. Are we doing it to find why? No. But in this case, we can do it to find state 6. So here, I know if I do a first law analysis on this closed feed water heater, and I can make the assumptions that we made to already derive this equation, I get that the sum of the mass flow rates in times H in is equal to the sum of the mass flow rates out times H out. In this case, my inlet states are going to be y times m dot times h2, and I'm going to have m dot times h5. The outlets, I'm going to have y times m dot times h7, and I'm going to have m dot times h6. And that's what this equation is telling me over here. I don't know the total mass flow rate through the system, but I also don't care because I can divide both sides of my equation by m dot total and cancel them out. Then I'll get this expression that y times h2 plus h5 is equal to y times h7 plus h6. The only thing I don't know in this equation is h6, because I've already done part a to find that y is 23%. So now I'm going to isolate for h6, and I'm going to put this information in my calculator, and I'll find that H6 is 623.9 kilojoules per kilogram. So I know we've been talking about Rankine cycles for a little while, and this is going to be our last lecture on Rankine cycles. But I would encourage you to continue thinking about these regenerative cycles that use Rankine because this, I think, is one of the two hardest cycles that we learn in this class. So I think if you know how to do this, then you'll be in pretty good shape. Again, the tricky parts of these cycles are that you need to be able to conserve mass because the mass flow rate isn't the same through every component. And you need to remember to look at the first law of the feed water heaters so that you can find why. So thanks for joining me here on Thermodynamics. I'll see you all again next time.